In our previous tutorial, we looked at how we can perform unilateral matching with a transistor, whereby we assume that the S12, S parameter of the transistor, is relatively insignificant, and hence we can consider the input and output as separate ports. We can look at their impedances and then use conjugate matching to achieve an improvement in gain. We also saw how the S12 for this circuit that we've got here is such that we can't actually use the unilateral assumption without incurring in some trouble. In particular we saw that when we match the output of our transistor then this changed the input reflection coefficient quite considerably. However, we did achieve some improvement in the gain of the transistor. We went from 11.8, which was the basic S21 of our biased and stabilized transistor, to 16.1 dB. Now, can we improve this further? Can we use a method that takes into account that our S12S parameter is not negligible and hence allows us to match the transistor in an optimal way which takes into account the fact that there is some interaction between the output and the input. The answer is yes, we can, and uh, this is explained in the manual. We can use a technique which is called simultaneous conjugate match. This technique looks at the mass of the S parameters and gives us expressions both for the input and output impedances which we would like our transistor to see to achieve maximum gain. This method does not see the input and output ports as separate. We match both input and output at the same time and uh, we achieve the maximum gain. So do we need to go through complex calculations? Well, normally if we did it manually, we'd have to, of course, go through the formulae. Microwave Office comes to the rescue in this instance, since it allows us to uh, just set up some measurements which will give us the uh, simultaneous conjugate match impedances for both the input and output ports. So let's open a new graph. It'll be a uh, SMIT chart because we want to see the uh, input and output impedances which we need to use to maximize the gain of our amplifier. And we'll call it uh, simultaneous conjugate impedances. Now we can right click on the chart, go on to add a new measurement and then we'll go to linear and we'll select GM1 then we'll select the data source name as our S parameter measurement schematic and then click on apply to add it to the chart then we'll also click on GM2 and we'll keep the data source name to the same S parameter schematic and then click on apply and then OK and let's move the legend to the side to give us a bit more space and let's simulate. And now you may be wondering what's happened. Why don't we have those impedances that uh, we are looking for? You thought that I said that Microwave Office will give them to us really quite easily. Now, this is not an accidental mistake. I actually went through this because I wanted to uh, go through something that a lot of students encounter and then come and ask me about. In order to be able to use the simultaneous conjugate match technique, we have to have a transistor that is unconditionally stable at the frequency at which you want to obtain those impedances. Now, if we go back to our schematic, in previous tutorials, I approximated the value of the inductor that we used for the emitter degeneration to 0.8 nanoharis, although it was slightly higher. Now, we must make doubly sure that by making that approximation, we haven't changed the value of our stability factor mu, which tells us that the transistor is unconditionally stable if it's greater than 1, or potentially unstable if it's less than 1. So let's go back to graphs and create a new graph. Go for a rectangular one and uh, we'll call it stability factor. Then we right click, go on to add a new measurement and then we'll go on to linear and stability and we'll choose mu1 and then click on apply and also mu2 and click on apply. Then go OK. Now simulate. Now you can see that both 
factors are very, very close to 1 in value, but they're not actually greater than 1. And if they're not greater than 1, then Microwave Office will not calculate the simultaneous conjugate match impedances. So this is one thing that uh, I often point out to the students. What the students often do is minimize the value of stabilizing resistances or conductances or the values of the emitter degeneration reactive feedback elements to avoid losing gain. They want to try and keep their basic S to 1 as high as possible. But when you do that, if you're not careful, like in this case, then you end up with a stability factor which is too close to the boundary of 1. And hence, if you end up below that boundary, then when you try and calculate the impedances for your uh, simultaneous conjugate match, uh, things won't work, as we have seen. In order for the conjugate match of the input to be calculated, we must have mu1 greater than 1. And for the conjugate match at the output, we must have mu2 greater than 1. So both these factors have got to be greater than 1 in order for the simulator to give us the values of the impedances that we need to use to achieve maximum gain with the simultaneous conjugate match technique. So how can we increase the value of the stability factor? Well, this is easily done. We can just go back to the S-parameter schematic and we can make the value of the inductor which we use for emitter degeneration tunable by clicking on it with a screwdriver tool. And then we can uh, go back to our stability factor graphs, open the tuner, and slowly increase the value until we get to a point where both factors are greater than 1. Now you can see that for about 0.85 we are already there, but we are still quite close to the boundary. And another thing that's important to take into account is the fact that real components will have tolerances on them. So you have a declared value and then you have a plus or minus n percent uh, which will indicate that the uh, actual value will be in a range around that declared value. So if we increase this a little bit more and get up to say 0.9 then we'll know that even if we had a 5% tolerance on the element we would uh, still be in the safe region. So now we've tuned uh, our emitted generation so that we have both a mu1, an input stability factor, and a mu2, which is an output stability factor, greater than 1. This means that both the input and output impedances for simultaneous conjugate match will be calculated by the simulator and we should now be able to see them on the Smith chart. So let's just close the tuner and then let's go back to our Smith chart which has the simultaneous conjugate match impedances. Now you can see that they're both on there. So uh, as I said this is a very common question that the students ask. They try to stabilize the transistor whilst maintaining S21 to, to the maximum possible value and hence end up uh, on the wrong side of the boundary of stability and then the simulator will not give you what you're asking it to give you. So now we've got these two values. Now, these values already represent the values that we want the transistor to see. We don't have to display the conjugate of these values. So effectively, we have to start from our source impedance of 50 ohms and get ourselves to the uh, GM1 value. And then we have to also start from the load impedance of 50 ohms and work our way back to the GM2 value. So let's get started with this. Let's go to circuit schematics, open a new schematic, and we'll call it input match. Then, as usual, we'll add a resistor which represents the internal resistance of our source. And this would be 50 ohms. We add a ground and one end of it, and then at the other end, by pressing Ctrl P, we can insert a measurement port which allows us to see the impedance of our source for now and then of our source plus the input matching network later on. Now let's go back to graphs, open a new graph and we'll call it input match. It will be a Smith chart of course. Click on create 
And then first thing we need to change the appearance of the chart by going on to properties and then we can select both impedance and admittance grids to be visible, take off the values, make the contour density coarse and then we can also go to format and make the impedance lines green, the admittance lines red, click on apply and then OK. Then uh, we'll need to add our target impedance, so we go to add a new measurement and then to linear and we'll put GM1 from the S parameter schematic and again remember we just get the normal complex value of it. Click on apply and then OK. Then we also want to see the impedance of our source so we just right click, go on to add a new measurement and then we will go to linear, port parameters, S parameters, S11 from the input match schematic click on apply and then OK. Then simulate. So this is our starting point and this is our target point. Yet again we'll carry out some transmission line matching since as we said the frequency is high enough for our wavelength to be low enough and make this practical. And this can be realized as you can see uh, in one of two ways. We can either add an open circuit stub and then a stretch of transmission line or we can add a short circuited stub and then a stretch of transmission line. We'll start with the open circuited stub. So let's go back to our input match schematic and then we'll insert an open circuited stub and set its frequency to 1900 MHz and also we'll uh, insert a stretch of transmission line and we'll also set its frequency to 1900 MHz and then we'll connect it to the test port. Now, if we set the electrical length of our shunt stub to zero, this will have no effect at all. And if we set the electrical length of our transmission line to zero, this will also have no effect. So this network becomes effectively invisible. I can verify this by just uh, simulating quickly and then going back to the input match graph and you can see that nothing has changed at all. So let's go back to the schematic yet again. And now let's make both of these elements tunable. So we'll double click on uh, the stub, we'll start from zero, we'll make it tunable, go from zero to 180 degrees in increments of one degree, and then enable these limits, click on OK. And we'll do the same for the transmission line. So double click, and then click on tune, and again start from zero, and then go to up to a 180 degrees, and then in increments of one, and also enable these limits click on OK. Now go back to our graph. Now before we start matching we must have a circle of constant gamma so that we can work out the length of our stub whereas last time we could get the VSWR value directly from a measurement. In this case we can't do that because the simulator gives us a GM1 as a, as a specific impedance or reflection coefficient and uh, we need to calculate the value of BSWR from this ourselves. This is not too much of a chore, we can just uh, insert a marker by pressing Ctrl M and then clicking on the input impedance value for the simultaneous conjugate match and then we can right click, go on to properties, select the markers tab and then choose to have a display format of magnitude and angle for the reflection coefficient and then click on apply and OK. We chose the reflection coefficient because we know that the VSWR is equal to 1 plus modulus of gamma divided by 1 minus modulus of gamma. So this makes our calculation easier. And the VSWR turns out to be 8.35 approximately. So we can just right click on the chart, go on to add a new measurement. We'll select circles under the linear measurements. We'll choose VSWR circle and set as a value 8.35. Then simulate. Now let's move the legend out of the way and uh, we can now remove the marker because we don't need it any longer and you can see that a circle of constant gamma which goes through our target point has now been drawn by the simulator. Brilliant! So now what we can do is just open the tuner and then we have TL1 on the tuner which represents the length of our open circuit stub and TL2 which represents the length of our series transmission line. 
First thing we need to do is uh, increase the electrical length of the stub until we meet the circle of constant gamma. So let's do just that. And we can see that for about 69 degrees we get to the desired point. Now to move around in a clockwise direction along the circle of constant gamma we need to increase the length of our series transmission line. So if we start tuning this up we can see that when we get to a value of about 62 degrees we have reached our uh, target impedance. So let's close the tuner and go back to our schematic. Now we can as usual select all of this and then right click and select flip. Draw the axis about which we want to flip the circuit and we are done. So we've got a source impedance of 50 ohm here then we've got a matching network, which is effectively an L section realized in transmission line. And then at this port here, we will see our desired impedance uh, GM1. Once we've got GM1 at the input and GM2 at the output of the transistor, we should have a maximum gain. So it's time to get on with matching the output. Let's right click on circuit schematics and go to new schematic. And we'll call this output match. First of all, we'll put in a resistor which represents our load. We'll give it a value of 50 ohms, and then we'll add a ground at one end of it. We'll press Ctrl P to insert a measurement port. We'll connect this to our load, and then we need to create a new graph to represent the output impedance. Well, as we did before, we don't want to set up the uh, Smith chart all over again, so we can just right click on the input match graph and select duplicate graph. We'll then rename this graph and we'll call it output match. And then what we can do is right click on it, go on to modify measurement and we'll start with GM1. We don't want to see GM1 here because that's the input impedance. We want GM2. Again coming from the S parameter measurement schematic and again, make sure this is just the complex value, not to conjugate, and click on OK. Then we'll go again to modify measurement and we'll change the input match S11 to the output match S11, and then click on OK. And then let's simulate. Now on this chart, we've got our load impedance of 50 ohms and the output impedance, which we want our transistor to see, when using a simultaneous conjugate matching technique in order for the gain to be maximized. Yet again, we need to draw a constant VSWR circle, which is also a constant gamma circle. So the first thing that we'll do is press Ctrl M and then click on uh, the GM2 point. We already have the marker readout in the right format in this case, so we can directly calculate the VSWR. And the VSWR in this case turns out to be 23.7. So finally we can right click on the graph, go on to modify measurement and then we'll go to VSWR circle and uh, we will set its value to 23.7. And now you can see that we have a constant gamma circle where the uh, modulus of gamma is equal to that of our target point. So we can get rid of the marker yet again. And in this case as well, the way that we can realize the match if using a transmission line approach is to either have an open circuited stub to go to the intersection with the constant gamma circle and then a serious transmission line to get to a final point. Or we could equally have a short circuited stub which will again take us to the intersection of the constant conductance circle with the uh, constant gamma circle and then we could again add a transmission line to get to our final point. For consistency with the approach that we've used before we'll just go for the open circuit stub to begin with. So let's go back to our schematic here and let's add these two elements. An open circuit stub first in shunt with our load Remember to set the frequency to 1900 MHz and then we'll add a stretch or transmission line. And remember to set its frequency to 1900 MHz and then connect everything together. Now, as before, we will make both of these elements tunable 
and uh, we'll start for both of them with a value of 0, so they're effectively invisible, and then a range of 180 degrees with a step of 1 degree. So we've sorted out our stub, and then we'll do exactly the same for our transmission line. And then if we click on Simulate, and quickly take a peek at the graph, you can see that nothing has changed. Now we can open the tuner, and then again TL1 represents my open circuit stub and TL2 represents my stretch of series transmission line. So let's first start increasing the value of our stub until we uh, get to the intersection of the constant conductance circle and the uh, constant gamma circle and this happens when the stub is about 78 degrees in electrical length. Then we can start increasing the electrical length of the series transmission line and this takes us up to a value of about 84 degrees. So now we've got a match for our output as well. So let's close the tuner. Now we've transformed our input impedance into the impedance that the simulator told us the transistor would like to see at its input terminals to maximize the gain. And also, we transformed uh, our output impedance into the impedance GM2 that the simulator told us the transistor would like to see at its output terminal to maximize the gain. Make no mistakes, you can't put in these two matching networks independently. They are designed in such a way as to assume that if you put one at the input, the other one will be at the output and vice versa. So the approach is quite holistic. It takes into account the two ports simultaneously. So you need to match both input and output to GM1 and GM2 respectively and then put everything together at the same time. So again we don't want to meddle with our S-parameter measurement schematic so we just right click and duplicate the schematic and then we rename it and we'll call it S parameter matched with open circuited stubs TLOC. Now we can make a little bit of space at the input and a little bit of space at the output as well so that we can insert our matching networks. And then we can go back to the input match schematic, select the matching network, press Ctrl C and then go back to the main transistor schematic and press Ctrl V to paste it at the input of the transistor and then reconnect everything together. Then we can go to the output matching schematic and again grab the output matching network, press Ctrl C, go back to the amplifier schematic, press Ctrl V and then place this matching network at the output of the transistor and reconnect everything together. There is a much easier way to get the input and output matching networks into the schematic through the use of sub-circuits, but we will be looking at those a little bit later on. Just be aware that there is an easier way to do this. At the moment I just want to keep things uh, visualized in a very clear way, that's why I'm, I keep using this sort of approach. So now we've got the whole schematic set up and we have inserted matching networks which will give us simultaneous conjugate match and hence theoretically maximum gain. So let's go back to graphs, open a new graph, this time it will be a tabular graph and we'll call it as parameters. Then we right click, select add a new measurement, we go to port parameters, as parameters and let's start with our gain, S21 coming from the S parameter matched schematic and we'll also display this as a magnitude in dB as we did before. Click on apply and then we'll look at the S11 and we'll display this just as a magnitude and then same thing for the output we'll look at the S22 and then click on apply and for completeness we'll put the S12 in there as well. Click on apply and then OK. Now simulate. Now we've achieved a gain of 17.7 dB. Remember that the best we could achieve with the unilateral approach was 16.1. So we've got an extra 1.6 dB of gain for our transistor. And the other thing that we've got 
is low values for both the S11, the input reflection coefficient, and S22, the output reflection coefficient. So we've achieved really quite a nice result when we have the highest gain we've achieved so far and we have low reflection coefficients for both input and output ports.